Yeah, so it's hard to sum this all up, but I'll try. Um, we'll try. So, can you hear me back there? I had to ask that. Um, so, yeah, so I started working on this series of drawings last year during the pandemic, and um, it's, it's coming out of some earlier work, which I'll get to in a little bit, but it's really uh, sort of fundamentally linked to the time we live in. And the work developed sort of organically. Um, I just want to start by jumping right into the images. And I will explain a little bit as I go along. And maybe we can have the, the lights. These, um, I think Gina's got it. Let's see. There we go, perfect, okay. okay. Probably the color's a little better that way. Um, so this, the series of drawings started during the pandemic when um, birds actually flourished for the first time in uh, several decades in the United States. And um, also I had more time to notice them, <laughs> as did many other people. So I started looking at them and drawing them. Uh, I had a sabbatical from teaching for a year, coincidentally, and all my travel plans were sort of thrown out the window. So I was uh, kind of stuck in the Philadelphia area. And I went out for walks and looked at birds. So uh, one thing I noticed is birds, yeah, they're, they're kind of everywhere. If you go outside and just open your eyes and your ears, you'll hear them and, and see them. And I also started to notice that a lot of uh, sort of popular culture emphasizes the males of the species over the female. And so when I started to work on these, I got interested in showing both the male and the female. And sometimes they're very similar and other times they're quite different. So the cardinals that you're seeing first were the, some, you know, some of the really noticeable differences and really beautiful differences too. Each of the birds had its really own special beauty. Um, blue jays. So a lot of the birds I saw right in my own neighborhood, from my window, my studio, or in my backyard. And others I saw walking in the city or in um, nature centers in the area like John Hines or Hawk Mountain. So the blue jays, they look quite similar actually, the male and the female. So one of the things I really enjoyed when I was working on this project is just getting immersed in a particular species, finding out about them, um, learning about their habits, their migration, their behavior, courtship, everything. And each one of them, I won't get into that because that'll take hours, but each one of them had like a really special story that um, kind of opened up as I worked on them. I should mention these are tiny, tiny drawings. So they're the, they're the size of a business card, two by three inches. And it's sort of funny to see them projected really big like this. This is not, <laughs> this is not at all what they look like. Um, the book that we made, there it is back there, is um, all the reproductions are actually accurate, accurately sized. So they're, they're very tiny. Um, these are wood thrushes. Very difficult to see in the trees, but they have a beautiful song. And a painted bunting, quite rare in the Philadelphia area. But I did see one. Uh, actually, this was seen a few years ago, but um, that's the male, that's the female. So quite different. Yeah, I did, um, when I made up the rules for this project, it's my project, I'll do whatever I want. And that was kind of the, that was the, the overriding principle. So I was rigorous about certain things, but other, other aspects, I, I did what I wanted. So some of the birds I didn't actually see, I'll admit that. <laughs> but I did see these uh, belted kingfishers up close, amazing birds. And... Uh, they're very small, but they're, they're like, they're bruisers. <laughs> they just, they fly like you're going to get the way, get, get the hell out of the way when they come through. Really intense. 
They remind me of my dog, kind of. Zuzu. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, turkey vultures. Yeah, and a lot of these birds have, like, mythology about them in popular culture that is actually kind of inaccurate. And so when working on the project, it was interesting to find out how much, you know, how much we get wrong about them. And um, as, I, as I went further with the project, it seemed important to, like, spread the, the truth about birds <laughs> <laughs> and, and get rid of some of the disinformation. But they're actually really amazing birds. And you'll hear more about them <laughs> from Lisa. Yeah. So I got a really good up close look at one on a tree branch just a few feet from me. Um, the hawks, red tailed hawks. So I live in Center City, Philadelphia, near the Art Museum. And we've had a pair of hawks there for the last, oh man, 20 years or so. Um, and it's gone through different uh, partnerships during that time, but um, that was that's always been really inspiring to me. So this is a hawk named T4, <laughs> a male hawk, and this was Mom, who was uh, presided over the the city for uh, over a decade, and had many many. Um, they're not litters; they're broods, I guess. Uh, many, many successful offspring. So she's kind of a hero. Um, snowy owls, which I didn't, I haven't seen in the wild. I'll confess to that, but I just love these birds. And um, what else can I tell you? When I worked on the drawings, I I worked with, um, in terms of technique. They're drawn first lightly in pencil, which I'll talk about more in a minute, and then uh, with Conte, which is a chalk, and watercolors. So I kind of experimented with the colors differently in each of the drawings, but I, I wanted to really keep the focus on the birds and um, keep the, you know, the wild backgrounds to a minimum. There's a few that go a little crazy, but... But mostly, it's really about just showing the bird in its, kind of in its ambiance. Um, goldfinches. So, yeah, and I'm not going to show you all of them. I just wanted to give you a taste of what the, the series is like. Um, how many did I make? 82, I think. So they're all pairs. 41, yeah. And, um, and this, the exhibition at the drawing room has most of them, not all of them, but. So it's, it's a series that I, I really consider ongoing. I haven't added to it recently because I've been busy with this exhibition and the book. Uh, but I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> I still have lists of birds that I need to get to. <clears throat> so that's the the female goldfinch. And morning doves. Let's see. Here. And yeah, and one of the things that I was interested in in this project is um, not just kind of showing people the the amazing sort of beauty and um, scientific appeal, if you, if you will, of birds, but to, to sort of bring attention to the current plight environmentally and the, the um, uh, really the catastrophic um, uh, loss of bird species over the, over the last few decades, um, which is extremely troubling. And um, Yeah, even ordinary bird species that we think. There's plenty of those. There actually, there's not. There's not as many. They're all, all the numbers have reduced by at least 30% over the last few decades. And um, many of them are in danger of extinction in the next few decades. 
So, and this is due to a lot of different um, different things. So, from habitat loss to um, the the global warming, the change in the food cycle. There's many things contributing to that. So, one of my goals was to to help just bring more visibility to this issue. So, this is a green heron. And there's there's a lot of these around the area. You can see them in they're usually in the water or near the water. And okay, so I started working on this series over a year ago and as I worked, I started to think these will these are a, something they added up to something as a group. So I started to think about making a book. And um, yeah, I think it was by about January, right, when I talked to you, Nat. Like, I, w I didn't know exactly how to do it, and um, I knew I wanted a small book, sort of a, almost like a guidebook, a bird guidebook. And uh, so we started talking about it, and um, then it took on, a, that took on a life of its own, <laughs> which you guys can talk about a little bit, but um, it was a really, it was a really exciting moment when I realized these drawings were kind of moving towards a bigger vision that we all kind of share, and also the the creative uh, growth and exploration that we undertook with this collaboration. I think is was really unexpected when I first started out doing the first few bir birds. So. Um, yeah, I think we talked about, I asked you first if you'd maybe help me, maybe write an introduction. I think I was nervous about asking for more than that. But it turned into a collaboration where two poets, two amazing poets just got on board and we went for this ride. So these are great horned owls, amazing birds. And an eastern towhee. These are really funny little birds, and they sort of scramble around on the ground looking for things. And I watched one, this is a male, um, rooting around looking for things to eat, you know, poking at leaves and running around, and is quite entertaining. That's the male. This is the female. Slightly different color. But it's, it's a type of sparrow. It's a small bird. And this is a familiar bird. Um, I also think it's kind of interesting, like the like with the vulture, like birds get reputations, like, oh, that's a junky bird. <laughs> that's a low life bird. <laughs> but in some ways, I kind of, I really kind of relate to those birds the most, and the really rare ones. I mean, I. They have a special place in my heart, but these, or, like the ordinary birds, are just just as precious. <laughs> so, yeah, they're very adaptive. Let's put it that way. They're they're much more adaptive. Um, some of them still migrate, but a lot of them have sort of set up camp, and they just, you know, they found a good place to to um, make a life for themselves. And harass people on, <laughs> on bikes. <laughs> yeah. That's the uh, the partner to the previous one, and they the male and the female of this type of bird, the Canada goose. Uh, they actually do look quite similar. Um, and this is another really common bird, the grackle, common grackle. So the male and the female of this species also look pretty similar. Um, and I think I might be getting close to the end of this group. Uh, a herring gull. So another bird. I, I'm from Wisconsin, so I don't know much about seabirds. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting for me to like, Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a herring gull. There's a lot of these around. They're 
they're common birds. Um, and they seem to always have kind of an attitude. <laughs> but again, they're a species that's pretty adaptive, but still declining, like, like many others. So, um, yeah, and very, uh, yeah, oh, very vocal. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so you get a sense of like, you know, what I was interested in with these with these birds. This is just a sampling of, of the whole group. Um, I think as I developed them, they got a little more um, nuanced. Like the first few that I made were, were much more kind of brutal in a way. And I started to try to get more nuance into the character of the birds, really, you know, studying the behavior and the character of each species. So, um, Anyway, okay, so going back a bit, one of the things that started me looking at um, birds is uh, I grew up in Wisconsin and I listened to the wonderful world of nature on the radio in my science class, learned about nature, learned about birds, and I always loved bird books, bird illustrations, um, natural history museums, and uh, some of the sort of forthright um, illustration of birds has always kind of inspired me. So this is, um, I think this is Conrad Gessner, one of the early um, ornitholo ornithologists. An illustration of an um, ostrich. And I think another thing that really interested me about these natural history illustrations is just how the bird is sort of shown in this magical place, and in this one in particular, this strange thing, you know, it's sitting on a tree, a rock, holes in the rock, and it's in this sort of magic place. Um, so that's, that's something I've always liked. Um, looking at Audubon, um, especially now, like it's, it's sort of poignant to see his quite beautiful illustrations of birds, but also to realize all of them were dead. <laughs> um, it, it lends a different um, content to the work. Uh, when I worked on my birds, I didn't kill any birds to, no <laughs> birds were harmed. <laughs> um, I did find some window strike birds. I did find some dead birds, um, but it seems sacrilegious to use them as illustration subjects. So I mainly use Google Images and my own photographs so to compile the imagery. Um, I'll, I'll show you just a couple of things that go into the background. Uh, these are some drawings done at um, a natural history museum where I work from the specimens in the museum, study the, you know, the, the, the shapes and the, the the movement of different birds in taxidermy positions. This is an osprey. Um, some chicks, various chicks. And um, goldfinches. So it's, it's very difficult to sit down and draw a bird. I have tried to do that a few times, and usually you get one line and the bird moves. So drawing from the um, taxidermy uh, specimens is, is helpful to learn, um, learn about the, the shapes of different birds. So that's, that goes into the background of them. Um, here's a setup, if you're interested. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how I work. Um, it's a very small, they're very small drawings. This might show you, a, you know, even more clearly how small they are. Uh, watercolors, Conte, brushes, and so forth. And there's four drawings on that little, that little board. And there's a, can you even see that? Does that show up yeah. at all? Yeah. yeah, okay. So that's, that's four of the, four, no, three sets of drawing of birds um, when I first get started, like figuring out what it's going to be. The vultures are down at the bottom.
by the way. So it just starts out with a pencil sketch. And then here's an example of as I start working with them. Um, I was interested in having each pair of birds kind of relating to um, its partner, either you know directly looking at it or engaging it or ignoring it. Like there's, I wanted to have some sort of dialogue. So, um, so yeah, that's my that's my stick. <laughs> um, Yeah, I think that, I don't know, we're going to talk more afterwards, but um, yeah, I think for me this project was just super inspiring to learn about birds, to get outside, um, to try to, you know, maybe show more people about what's around us and pay attention to it because it's not going to be around a whole lot longer. And... Um, yeah, in terms of the collaboration, it was amazing to work together on the on the book. Um, it just really came together. And we had a wonderful designer who put it together into book form for us, Andrea Hemmen. So um, yeah, I feel very fortunate. So that's that's the you know that's the basics of the project. Um, I guess we'll answer questions afterwards. Okay. So we're gonna go right into the. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you can use this if you want. So it'll go. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Breathe. All right. So um, thanks, Susan. That was great. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about um, our process for writing these poems. Um, uh, Nat and Susan asked me if I wanted to participate in coming up with some sort of poetic form that could respond to the poems. And um, one thing we wanted to do, so we felt like we were collaborating with Susan because we're looking at the images and we're inspired by the images, but we also wanted to collaborate with each other. We didn't want to just write be in our rooms writing our poems on our own. We wanted to somehow expand that collaborative spirit to the poems. So we thought it, we look, you know, we thought the ideal thing is to find a form that we can try to respond to. And we picked this form called the rondelet. It's a French form and we we used it very loosely. And the reason we chose it is because the rondelet has a um, line that repeats. So we have this example written by Louis Turco, who wrote this book about forms. And um, do you want to read sure. the Sure, I'll read it. Example. So um, w we especially liked this little example because it uses birds. Right. And um, it, I guess it's a British example, and so some of the birds are not familiar to us here. So the swift is a bird, the phoebe is a bird, and then the others dove cat, bird, owl, you'll recognize. Um, so the, the form of this is seven lines, and the first and the third and the seventh line are all identical. And you'll see when I read it, these are short-lined poems. Now, we, we broke all of those yeah, rules. All of those rules. <laughs> we were like, we don't, yeah. It's a very vaguely inspired. Poem. Yes, yes. But um, this is called The Swift Replies. The swift replies fall from air to the ear in spring. The swift replies to the Phoebe, who sounds her sighs to dove call the cat bird crying. And when the owl goes questioning, the swift replies. <clears throat> so what we decided to do was to borrow that repetition of one line three times in the poem. Um, but we also decided that we would pick a line, like Nat wrote the first poem, and then I read her poem and I picked one of her lines and I made that my repeating line. So one of the lines from Nat's poem was the first line of my new poem. And then I tried to repeat that line two more times. Yeah. So we ended up basically doubling the rondelet. With like not quite 14 lines, but 12 to 13 lines. And our... Um, 
our repetitions are improvisational, yeah. I would say. Yeah. There's no you line know, I, I challenge you to see if you recognize <laughs> the repetition. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So yeah. that's basically yeah. what we did. And I just want to say that um, I've never done anything like this before. I've never, like, written poems with other people or used other people's lines in my poems. And it was really exciting and really challenging to try to figure out how to make the line work in my poem. Yeah. But I felt like it was super rewarding, and I recommend it. I recommend collaborating. I think it's a really fun project. Yeah. Well, one of the exciting things about this, we started out the project by, well, we didn't exactly start it out this way, but rapidly, we made lists for ourselves of birds, first of all, that were familiar to us personally, and for me, that was all my backyard, and Lisa, the entire world. Um, and uh, <laughs> but we also made lists of um, of, of paintings that we especially loved, um, whether we knew the bird intimately or not, from Susan's collection. So we were kind of playing back and forth between those two. We knew in advance a lot of birds that we each would like to work with. But the thing is that you couldn't choose until you got the poem right. because you couldn't know what word was, I mean, excuse me, what line was repeatable. You couldn't know how that might fit. Yeah. So it was this really interesting summer of intense, deep study and then rapid <laughs> Epic writing, panting, yes. <laughs> uh, writing of the drafts, and so yeah. it was. It was. It was so, uh, exciting. Yeah, but, I mean, there's a way. You know, the images have a kind of feeling of being rapidly created, and I think the poems mirror yeah. that. Yeah. And just um, one other thing, I want to sort of say about my own experience with this is that. I already had, I think the reason Susan and Nat invited me is because I write about birds a lot in my poems. I'm not a birder, and I don't know anything about birds, but I love them, and I love encountering them, and so then I want to learn about them, and I love learning about them. And it, and it was just so much fun to learn about these birds. But I also realized that I, I'm obsessed with birds. You know, like I just doing this made me realize that I have a story about every bird, you know, pretty much. Um, something that happened in that, like in, I guess the idea that birds really honestly genuinely enrich my life not because I am a birder but because I encounter them and also a lot of my encounters were during the pandemic when I was I spent about six months in the Pacific Northwest and I went on hikes every day and I saw tons of birds and my experience would be pretty much exactly the opposite <laughs> to that <laughs> um, in the workshop this afternoon um, I joked with you know like it you could be a birder, you could raise birds, or it could be that you recognize one when you see it, <laughs> like, that's a bird. <laughs> and I would say that I was closer to that pole. Um, but uh, one thing that's been really interesting for me has been that as I've written these poems, uh, a lot of the birds, uh, when I started out, were birds that were familiar to me. But during the course of the last year, or the last six months, I've seen more of the birds, including ones that Lisa wrote about or ones that neither of us wrote about. Um, yeah, uh, it's, so it's really thrilling. Yeah. I, I saw, um, uh, uh, what's the name of it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a downy woodpecker, which I did write about um, uh, just uh, on my way back from the polls yesterday, so, oh, cool. or, or Tuesday. So, cool. yeah, it's really, really cool. But we'll, we'll get started yeah, now. Yeah, we'll get started. Yeah, here, this is it. You can I did do it. it. Okay. Oh, Oops. wait, it Sweet. went to, okay. yeah, okay. there we go. So this is a Carolina wren. I grew up in South Carolina, and the Carolina wren is a state bird of South Carolina. And so when I saw... Um, these images um, of the birds when Susan posted them on Facebook, I kind of fell in love immediately. And so it's not surprising that this is the first bird that I chose to write about. So here's my poem about the Carolina wren. Shy one in the thicket, how is it there? Among tangled brambles, among drifted timbers, thick there in the thicket. Shy one, how is it we never met there, or among the overturned, the overgrown, unkempt, 
dilapidated. You, with your jaunty juts, your chewily, chewity, chupity, your whit, whit, wheat, your dick, dictation. I'm eyeing your supercilious streak, your chestnut, chipmunk, eye of Horus markings at the eye, recalling snake sloughs threading the nest as talisman. How is it, shy one, in the thick of it, the thicket? <clears throat> okay, so this is an American coot. And um, this is one of those birds that are kind of like an extraordinary bird, you know. Um, and I saw some, I, my mom lives in California and I was visiting my mom and my mom likes to feed the ducks. And so we go to feed the ducks and among the ducks were these American coots and I didn't know what they were. And then when Susan shared the images of these birds and I'm like, oh, it's an American coot, that's what I saw. And I was just so excited to know what this bird was because they're very odd and strange. I don't know if you can tell, um, but they have these very, very weird feet that are almost um, neon yellow green. Um, they're lobed. And they, but they're, they, I saw them among ducks and seagulls and they swim and stuff, like they're swimming birds. So they're, they're very strange. And I also like their name, um, American coot. So here we go. We never met there along the overpass where gulls and pecans gather to feed. Never met, but there amid the overflung torn bread and bird seeds scattered on bike trail and ragweed patch, I've reckoned your ruby eye and charcoal American cool, your curiously sloped white bill. A water bird, you float and glide as smooth as any green-necked mallard. But I have never seen you overturned among downy bottoms and speckled backsides, your almost prehistoric palmate yellow-green toes grappling the air above the pond's dark skin of blotted neon scum. So here's the little goldfinch. Um, a goldfinch is a bird I always desired to see and hadn't seen. Um, and then uh, this year, uh, uh, actually it's a little earlier than this year, but I had a tree that had to be taken down in the side of my uh, house, uh, a, a tree <clears throat> where I had put, um, had hung from the branches some uh, bird feeders, including thistle. <laughs> and so now I have an entire side of my yard, which is thistles. <laughs> you don't want this, except that, um, uh, goldfinches love thistles, and so for the first time, as I was deciding what bird to write about, goldfinches appeared in my yard, and I felt like, well, okay, here's a sign. Goldfinch. Above the pond dark, so let me start that again. Above the pond dark green and neon blots of thistle, a gleam so flash it's gone before it's spied. A minor sun cresting the barbed green leaf and bristling down of thistle. Or, no, two suns and a dun moon, vaulting glints, streaks, apogees. How I wish one might call from the air a sky of them, a galaxy too flash to be flesh or feathers, all pluming themselves, all preening in sweet consort their elegant radiance in a field all sting, balanced on barbs, on a leaf's knife edge, on spine or spur of thistle. Ah, bounding light, flutter over this prickliness, lean into the withered bloom, snaggle it, strip it clean, and let the down go floating above the bladed green, above the livid thistles. Okay, here's a raven, familiar bird. Um, I don't know if everybody knows this, but ravens are super smart. And um, my encounter with raven, like I actually saw these videos where these, this raven was like communicating with the person that, you can look it up on YouTube, they're amazing. Um, and uh, so anyway, my encounter with ravens took place on a 
trip that I took on the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. And um, ravens are notorious on the canyon. Like you go, it's a 16 day trip and you stop at beaches and camp and stuff. It's a rafting and kayaking trip. And um, the ranger told us to be wary of the ravens and be aware of them. So that's how uh, ravens sort of came into my, my encounter with ravens. Okay, so raven. A gleam, a flash that's gone before it's spied not sun, but shimmer of black tail, black wing, or some precious thing snatched in a flash, a gleam that's gone before it's spied, being carted toward a secret beach or rocky crag down canyon, sooty and noisy, a passerine, a songbird, at every stop along the Colorado through the Grand, a pair surveyed our camp, eyeing your camera, demonstrating skill with zippers and diversion until a gleam so flash was gone before we spied my yellow scarf aloft, a minor sun, and your watch swift and glinting in raven flight. Fodder for the mess of sticks, fur, bark, and hair, the four to seven eggs dyed the same moony turquoise green of Havasu Creek. So this next bird is a European starling. And um, uh, with that name, it might surprise you that it's an American bird, a bird of North America. And in fact, it is an import. All of the starlings, and you know that there are a million of them. If you have a yard, you have starlings coming through um, and uh, sort of patrolling the lawn and putting their beaks down into it, grabbing little grubs down in there. Every one of those starlings is a descendant of a flock of 12 that were imported to uh, Central Park by enthusiasts of Shakespeare who wanted to have all of the birds of Shakespeare available in the United <laughs> States. And so, there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'll say one more thing about them. Uh, which, just because it was interesting to me, the, um, you'll see them going through a yard and they'll peck down, you know, like peck down. But what they're doing is they're putting their beak down and then they open their beak in the soil so that they're opening a space where they can grab a little a grub. But they pierce down and then open. Yeah. European starling. Sheen of black, shimmer of blue-black, a blue-black back stalking the yard. Bright sky at midnight, shouldering its sheen, its shimmer, its black, its blue-black armor. A thug, so iron-clad, so steely, so Elizabethan. Two steps and a stab, an opening jaw, a maw. And yet each daggered layer of it, rough, cape, crown, covert, mantle, scapular, starts off razor-edged, blazed silver-white along its glossy wing and back, its metallic blue-black sheen and shimmer. Creaks and squeals, rasps and wheezings. At its throat, its purple gone opal, gone amethyst. At its wing, its turquoise gone teal. Sheen of black, of midnight blue-black. Its Darkness stalking, chest medallioned with stars. Uh, so um, I don't really have a story about the redwood, red red winged blackbird, except that when I was staying in the Pacific Northwest during the pandemic, I just saw a bunch of them. They were they seemed to be everywhere, and um, I just had this. My, so my encounter with them was kind of a sad one, but. So, um, a shimmer, then creaks and squeals, rasps and wheezings, somewhere in the shimmery field of silver grass. Yes, squeaks and creels, and my own rasps and wheezes as I ran the marshy path, river path and almost stumbled on a fistful or ring of pale orange tail feathers, each one the size of a finger and edged in dusky brown. The rest of her, 
in the talons, in the creak and squeal, the wheezing grasp of something sleek and hungry flying up ahead. The well-made cup woven from strands of willow bark and cattails was empty too. At the top of the alders and wind-worried locusts, her blacker, better half lifted the leading edge of wing and plumped his red shoulder patches, singing his heart out. So I just have to say, I found these feathers and I didn't know what bird they belonged to for the longest time until I was working on this project. And I looked on, the Cornell has this amazing site about birds and they showed that females have these um, tail feathers that are orange and brown. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't see them when they're, unless they're like opening their tail feathers. I guess. So the next bird is another one that I'll bet most of you have seen. This is a morning dove. Um, it, later in this poem, um, I quote uh, Audubon. I, both of us did a lot of research in various sites, and I tried to read the, um, the diary entries, journal entries that Audubon left about birds when they were available, as they clearly weren't with those Shakespeare birds. <laughs> um, but uh, um, there's another phrase here. The mellow, the melting accents, those are his words too, and I just don't tell you that they are, except for just now I did. Okay. <laughs> Morning Dove. Somewhere in the shimmery field of silver grass, dappled doves go nodding, go ooing and eyeing, shivering the grasses at silver dusk or dappled dawn, all shy come hither, all coy side sidle, always courting dawdling and delaying as lovers will, all complacence, all soft resistance, the long glide, the flap of a fan flicked open and closing, the whispering, whistling, whickering wing, the mellow, the melting accents, the rukul, the rukuru, the oh wow, the ooh. More a gleaner than a reaper, Audubon thought, no gleam or gloss to them. Yet gentling even the hard-edged seed in a crop filled with gravel, they're all soft pewter in the shimmer, the silver. Okay, here it is, the turkey vulture. And um, I was super excited to write a poem about a turkey vulture because... I see turkey vultures all the time in um, western Pennsylvania, where I also spend time, and they're just everywhere. And I, and I, was, I feel like they're very maligned creatures, and you know, people mostly associate them with very negative feelings and gloom and doom, and they're fascinating creatures, actually. And um, I loved learning about them, and I also had, well, I, I mean, I write about it in the poem, but I was driving on these very curvy roads, and all of a sudden there was a bird flying right in front of my window, like right in front of my windshield. It was like two inches from my face. And I could see that this was an incredibly majestic bird. And it was a turkey vulture that had been on the road eating some dead thing. And I mean, that was the first time I like, thought, wow, these birds are amazing. So I learned amazing things about them. And hopefully they'll commun be communicated <laughs> in my poem. Um, okay. No resistance in their long, soft glide, no awkward flap as they kettle the thermals to the high, thin altitudes. We too can't resist pulling over to witness the long glide or single flap that swoops them from tarmac to windshield height as we arrive in a squeal of brakes to interrupt their feasting. We dread the distinctive V of flight the two-toned under pattern of their under wings, but especially the featherless head, permanently grizzled the stomach clenching red of calamity. The turkey buzzard is no killer with her chicken-like claws and worried eye and has no song, just grunts a gut full of immunity to stave off cholera, even anthrax. Romantic too, when they go courting one bird gives up all resistance and flaps after the other, gliding and swooping in follow flight, twisting and turning over and over. 
So this next bird is a is a great egret, um, and I think that they're you know kind of all over the United States. But where I s have seen them is um, growing up in South Carolina, where they're these low country swamps, and um, the birds are just gorgeous. You'll s suddenly see one rise. Um, flying and they're they're amazing, but I didn't know a lot of details about their lives. And um, reading Lisa's poem about the turkey vulture with those last lines about what they do when they go courting, I thought, well, I wonder what these birds do when they go courting. And whoa, <laughs> <laughs> you need to watch these videos. You really need to watch these videos. So that's what this is all about. Great egret swooping and circling fainting and following, twisting and tumbling, the egret falls into love and thus into his ceremonious dancing, circling and sweeping, whirling and pirouetting over and over, with first the shall we, the gestural brow, the gracious obeisance, and then just like that, the head flung back, the crested mane of it, the loose lace cravat, the fringed mantilla, the neck stretched up and pointed skyward. Where's the stately waiter gone, the silent night flyer? Now he's all raw gutturals, all gra and grog, strutting the branches. Like a night-blooming Sirius flung open in an instant, he's thrown up his wings, shaken back his hair, each plume of him long and loosened, erect, recurved, overhanging, trailing. And she's eyeing that eloquence, that sweeping and swooping over and over and over. So, Jan, I love cranes. Um, cranes are like my favorite bird, maybe. And um, the thing is that um, Susan, Susan's art has inspired my poetry before. She did a series of sculptures of endangered species that kind of got me started writing about animals. And I, so I owe it all to Susan. And um, I wrote, she has a, a sculpture of a whooping crane. And I wrote a poem about a whooping crane. And I did a lot of research about whooping cranes that, who are, like when I was writing, I think there were like 70 whooping cranes in the United States. Um, now there are close to 800, apparently. Mm -hmm. So there's been a big conservation effort, and whooping cranes are coming back. But, you know, 800 is not very many whooping cranes, and um, it's great that, they, that they've been successful. Um, so I was sort of excited to learn about the sandhill crane, another bird that I really love, partly because sandhill cranes, there are 650,000 in the United States mm -hmm. still. It's one of the last birds, you know, great North American migrations is the migration of the sandhill cranes. Um, so, and so while I hadn't really had an encounter with one, I was excited to write this poem. Then the stately waders point skyward and are gone. Night flyers and day flyers, they flee the Gulf Coast in clusters in early spring. Not silent, they point skyward. Stately waders gone night flyer, day flyer, hundreds of thousands winging 200 miles or more each day. They ink the sky from edge to edge, a dusky gray, and darken the air with a trumpeting karoo, converging on the Platte River Basin, the pinch in the hourglass, midway through the last of the great North American migrations. Ancient, resilient, they refuel in the cornfields, roost in shallows, testing the iron-rich ooze for reptiles, the stain on their plumage like a rusty kiss or a wound. By April, the stately waders are gone, pointing skyward and night flying all the way to Siberia on tawny wings of supplication and praise. So you'll have noticed, listening to Lisa, how often she incorporates her own experience with these birds into the um, the poem, and since you've already heard that, you know I'm one step away from oh, it's a bird. Um, I, I haven't done that much, but I really admired it as I read uh, Lisa's poems one by one as we worked together, 
And um, so I decided that in the next poem, this is a Northern Cardinal, that I wanted to bring my own experience into this more. And um, you'll see how I did that. Uh, I, I'll, I'll say, uh, while I was growing up, my grandmother, who was uh, uh, actually um, an, a deft painter, a good painter, um, uh, tried to teach me how to paint. I would say something I'm interested in, but don't have a particular talent for. And um, so that's the start of this poem, Northern Cardinal. Ain't the sky a dusky gray from edge to edge? My grandma lessened me, gra uh, frowning over my shoulder at the red bird I'd inked against gray sky at her direction. My weak eye tilted the branch he perched on, bunched the magnolia I'd copied into a thickened fist, turned the bird's beak snarky. Come here, come here, she chide, pointing her finger, pew, 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 or snarky herself. He's got a lot to say. <laughs> Meanwhile, outside the window, he'd be swaying side to side, exulting, pretty, 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 black masked and bibbed as his modest wife nestled down in grape slips and bent grass. I tell you this not just from memory, that inky dusk, that clouded eye. Edge to edge, the paintings here, never sold as intended at the church bazaar, but kept, I have to think, because imbalances and attitudes suited her, herself a bright red soul against the winter white among the smaller sparrows. So, um, Hummingbird is, this is Anna's Hummingbird, and um, one of the things that I, that happened to me when I was living in the Pacific Northwest during the pandemic um, is that I found out that Anna's Hummingbird's um, don't necessarily migrate and that they overwinter and so like it was December and we saw a hummingbird come to the feeder our hummingbird feeder which was empty you know so it was like such a shocking experience to see a hummingbird when it was like I don't know 40 degrees out <laughs> and um, I, I had no idea that that was possible so um, that's what this poem is coming from Anna's Hummingbird um, a ruby-throated soul in early winter among the sparrows, smaller than them and lighter, quick, elusive war song of spring that returned in winter, an iridescent patch of fuchsia, bright against the spare, hazy air. With the AQI, finally yellow, even members of sensitive groups could take a short walk and return through brown tindered fields to greet the bright red soul in winter, breath white, sliding the air right up to my face and vibrating like a spirit messenger, not mine, but someone's, with crazy fast green-black wing feathers circling back and forth, bumping insistently against the abandoned blue glass feeder and dipping a feathered tongue into empty wells, gummy with sugary red before darting off his thin, metallic song, whining in the dusk, like another kind of sign entirely. So we're coming to the end. Oh, sorry, whoops. There we go. <laughs> we're coming, not quite as quickly as that. We're coming to the end of the sequence now. So this is my last poem. And this is the Downey Woodpecker. You just heard me say that I saw my first one um, just this week <laughs> on my way, way back from, uh, from voting. But I, I was happy to include this bird in my list because woodpeckers peck on my house all the time. <laughs> and uh, so you hear this, da -da 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 -da. and you know, I, I race to the window, I look outside, I can't see anything there. I know it's a woodpecker, it's clearly a woodpecker, but I, I, I don't see them. And so I like that sense of having someone knocking at your door and not being quick enough to open the door to whatever is being offered to you. That's where this started. Downy Woodpecker. Shaking the air like a spirit messenger, 
Shocking opened the air with an urgent knock, 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 mistaking my house for oak or aspen, shuddering the air about my ear, shaking me wakened, my spirit vibrating, a door croaking open. I've never seen him, but he's always knocking, thrumming out messages he needs no words for. Out beyond my window, he's braced himself for drum rolls, head side down or sidewise, toes clawed in, aft and fore, ruttering his sharp hammerings with his mere tail, whinnying a little before his din-a-din, his rat-a-tat, his brattle, his drub. It's a wonder he doesn't cold cock himself, hitting 17 beats each second, rapid fire, strict pace. These jolts, these staccato smacks and rebounds would stagger my brain in its human skull. But he's unfazed, shaking the air, scooting out his tongue, shocking up billfuls of beetles. Fay enigma with his downy back, chic checkered wing, smart red half cap. <clears throat> And the final bird is that amazing snowy owl, a bird like Susan that I have never encountered. Um, but I'm like, you know, I'm fascinated by owls. And um, the only thing I want to say about this poem is that at the end, I quote lyrics from a song um, that ha it's a traditional song called I Wish My Baby Was Born. And it was like revived sort of recently in the movie Cold Mountain. Um, so that's maybe, if, if you're familiar with it, maybe that's why. Um, and yeah, so I, I sort of um, cheat at the end and use uh, song lyrics at the end of my poem. Far beyond my window, downy head down, braced for spring, he's fled the Arctic and Alaska with its dwindling lemmings and bracing dark for a window beyond the tundra these dunes and fields, airports and marshes, where he can feast on voles, on water birds, rats, and even geese. Feathers on feathers of dense white and brown stippled plumage pantaloon his legs, enfold the toes and beak and almost invisible ears. His sanguine yellow eyes slide closed to leave a window or basket of downy white on white on white. Experts say her swiveling head is nothing more than two sharp eyes, two sharper ears. But the old song, Whistles and Haunts, says the owl, the owl, is a lonely bird, and like us, a source of terror. Sees someone's blood there on its wing, someone's blood there on its feathers. Thank you. Thank you. So we're happy to answer questions if Susan wants to come back up, if anybody has any. You don't, don't feel like you have to. <laughs> yeah, it's Alex. Hi. Um, uh, did you guys uh, divide up the birds like for writing solely based off of like um, who saw what? Or like did you like talk to each other like, I want to write about this bird? Like, how was it uh, done? I, 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 I can start. Okay. So, so when we started out, at the very beginning, it was just, I'd like to write about this, I'd like to write about this. But we decided that it would be good to have some kind of plan. And so I think I mentioned this earlier, we made these lists. And the lists were birds I'm acquainted with, which for me was what was in my backyard. And um, uh, birds that Susan had uh, made portraits of that we especially liked. And there was overlap between these two lists. There was, however, only one time when there was a conflict, and it wasn't really a conflict. It was the, uh, the red-winged blackbird, um, where uh, I had thought I might write about it, but Lisa had a better reason to write about it. I nabbed it. it. She did. She, <laughs> uh, she swooped in. I yeah. swooped in. I nabbed that blackbird. Yeah, yeah. But there, there it, we didn't make arrangements beforehand, but as we got close to it being our turn next, we might say, 
I might do the blue jay or I might do the eh, eh, or I might do this other thing. And the other person would say, yeah, sounds good. And, and then we'd get the other poem and it would be impossible to do those three words. So we'd be looking for them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, we basically made lists of birds we were interested in and then try, you know, like, so there was overlap. We tried yeah. to be reasonable about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I can say that I knew, like, I really wanted to write a poem about the European starling because I'd read these fascinating things Wait. about it. But, you know, uh, Matt wrote a first. great poem. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's a great poem. And uh, so, I, you know, I'm happy, sorry. happy to concede the starling. <laughs> <laughs> Bill. I, I have to admit, I'm not familiar with your art. Um, so maybe... I should know the answer, but why did you choose to work in such little uh, frames? Well, um, I, I do generally work on a pretty intimate scale with my sculptures and my drawings, but this was, this was the most extreme in terms of the, you know, the size. Um, and I've always been interested in miniatures, in, um, in the, the kind of intimacy that that gives you when you're, um, as a viewer and as a maker, uh, being that close to something, so yeah, it's just it's just a personal interest of mine, I guess. Yeah. To, to follow up on that, mm -hmm. I, I know your work well. Mm -hmm. I, I love the drawings and I love your sculpture. I mean, I love all your work. But seeing them big was really interesting, just to visually see them, the way the line was and the way the color met the line, the conte. Uh -huh. And I just wondered if that has given you, I mean, I thought the projections were pretty good. Uh -huh. Any ideas of working differently? Well, uh, yeah, and actually that came up when we made the book, because uh, initially I wanted everything to scale, and then Andrea had an idea to blow up some of the images, so the cover has a close-up, and there's some other close-ups in there. Mm -hmm. And so we started talking about how, as a, as a maker, I wear a I wear a visor, a magnifying visor, <laughs> and I use magnifying lenses. And I am, I see it at that scale. Oh, when I'm working, I'm that, I'm that close to it. But as a viewer, you know, just seeing it in a gallery or in person, you don't necessarily get that close to it. So it, yeah, it is kind of interesting to see them blown up. And, and some of them work better than others. Like, I found myself sitting there, you know, making faces at them. <laughs> like, <laughs> that one works, that one doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It could, it could lead to something. Uh, just to pick up on that theme, when I first mm -hmm. saw the images, uh, my wife, JC, told me about it, and, and I saw some images, and I thought, oh, my gosh, they are so small. Look at the detail. And then when you see it blown up, Mm -hmm. You see that it's the detail is different. Mm -hmm. That when they're really small, it looks like mm -hmm. I, you must have been working with a, a brush with just one bristle. Right. <laughs> it seemed like, <laughs> it's like that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. It's, it's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that I really love about seeing them blown up is the effect of the watercolor. Yeah. So that, mm -hmm. I mean, what you were just saying about the precision of it, yeah. the, um, that precision is a kind of expressionistic effect mm -hmm. that uh, one slosh of water over another slosh of water over another. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I actually love seeing them both ways mm -hmm. to get that sense of something concentrated and perfect and then seeing the mm, free hand mm -hmm. behind the perfection of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have to say I loved seeing them in the gallery. Yeah. I mean, so if you can make it to Philadelphia, yeah. it's really worth it. Yeah. It's just a whole different yeah. experience. Mm -hmm. And to see them all together yeah. is mm -hmm. really special. A lot of them are arranged at eye level, so you're looking at them, you know, like right here, right in front of yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're standing like two inches away from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. Well, I'll draw that out one more line. Then. Okay. So, <laughs> I was curious about how long it takes you to make one of those. Yeah. It seems to me that there's so much intense work in getting that small image and make it well so nice. Yeah, and it, it varied a lot, actually. So the, some of the earlier ones, uh, the cardinal was a pair was actually one of, the, one of the first ones, and they were done much quicker. So 
you can, I mean, at this scale, you can sort of reverse engineer and see the layers of watercolor that go on. And some of those just had, you know, two or three layers of watercolor. But the later ones, um, the, um, the Sandhill Crane, for instance, I, I was looking at that like, how many layers did I put on that? Like it almost <laughs> disappeared into the murk um, because there were, you know, that was much, much more time consuming. So they did vary quite a bit. So. I do have a follow on question. Thinking about the scale, do you work with the magnifying? Yes, glass yeah, on? yeah. So I have a, a, a visor with yeah. a magnifier on it. Yeah that I use most of the time. <laughs> do you, oh sorry, do you use that when you carve also? Sometimes, yeah, yeah with the detail. The details. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really cool. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about um, what was your, where did your impulse to collaborate come, you know, that, I think that's a really good thing to talk about. And we, we have talked about this a little bit more. Because um, initially, I had no, I didn't have an intention to do that. I, I'll admit it. I, as much as I like you guys, I love their poems. I've been a fan, but not in terms of collaborating. Uh, but it, it just kind of evolved. You know, it started out with a discussion, you know, about getting Natalie involved in some way. And then, you know, when Lisa got on board, it was super exciting because <laughs> then, you know, we had a team. <laughs> and um, I have to confess, I was nervous about it. Um, as an artist, I've worked individually, independently for my whole life, pretty much. I've done a few collaborations, but I usually work on my own. And to give up the control is really hard. Um, as much as I love and trust these these people, it, I also had to let go and just say, okay, you know, you do your thing. And I was just, I was stunned. I was floored with what they did when I first, when I saw the first drafts. I was, there were tears running down my face. It was so moving to read what they had produced. Um, <laughs> making me tear up <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> but, yeah, so it was a it was a collaboration that I couldn't have anticipated. I just I couldn't have imagined that. But. Can I make another observation? Mm -hmm. When you were talking about layering just a moment ago, like with the sandhill crane, mm -hmm. that's what I was hearing in mm -hmm. the poems. Now, to, mm -hmm. to a certain extent, I'm not surprised when that layers because <laughs> she does that. But she, Lisa, your layering was different. Had mm -hmm. narrative elements in it, but still. Mm -hmm. It was that going back and going over. I think that knit, yeah. it, it was a knit for me, just, mm -hmm. just breathtaking. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that were just serendipitous, I think. The, mm -hmm. the fact that we chose this form. When we started out, Lisa had suggested three or four different kinds of forms that we might try, and we tried them for the first one, and it was clear <laughs> that the others did not work at all. But this one actually invited us to vary, uh, and it invited us to layer. And, right. Uh, and, right. and um, Susan says a wonderful thing in her introductory comments to the book about how this form allowed it to be like birds answering other birds, bird's song answering other bird's song. And I can't say that I was especially thinking <laughs> that right, uh, while right. we did that, but um, as soon as I read it, it felt absolutely right that, right. Um, that I, neither one of us had worked with other people before, and so it was it was yeah. exciting it was and great. challenging. I mean, yeah, it was hard, you yeah. know. Um, but I feel like that layering you're talking about, JC, is like. Mm -hmm. you know, because of that repeated line, right? So how are you going to work that repeated line into yeah. your poem and make yeah. it, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it's like each poem has got like feathers from the other poem and, yeah. you know, they are mm -hmm. flapping along with the feathers <laughs> of mm -hmm. the new bird. And, yeah. 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 And I, and you know, when it was like, while it was happening, <laughs> it was like, I was like, I can't do this. It's just yeah. too hard. Right. It's, know, like, I would it's dread, stressful. Yeah. I would dread yeah. getting <laughs> Nat's email. <laughs> Oh no! She's done already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I gotta write another poem, and 
But then yeah. once I started working, it was like I loved having those lines to work against yeah. and yeah. with, you know, yeah. like it was mm -hmm. like I want that all the time now. You yeah. know, I want all, yeah. you know, I want everybody to give me lines that I can <laughs> yeah. use yeah. in my poems because yeah. it just, it was, yeah. it was like, you know, why, you know, why, why collaboration is great, while why working with other people is a great thing, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. because it sort of confirms your own experience. But it also broadens it and right. extends it. Right. It's just a wonderful argument for collaboration, yeah. I would mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Yeah. And also getting, you know, the thing is I feel like spending a lot of time looking at Susan's images, I felt like I was, I don't know, like it gave me this new understanding of the image and, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, being able to see all of the details and thinking of, thinking about what story mm -hmm. is being told by the images themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's so much personality in those, in the portraits. And right. To be able to gesture in the slightest way towards them was a great joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it. I should mention that when I first started this out, like I really was in the driver's seat completely. So all the choices of birds were 100% mine. But then as I started getting feedback, there were requests for certain birds. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, I don't know about Anna's hummingbird. I haven't seen one of those lately. I have seen one in the past, but but yeah. It, and then I thought, of course, we need one. <laughs> yeah. So there were. I mean, there was some back and forth that I wish I, in some ways, I would have had that sooner. But right. anyway, it happened the way it happened, and yeah. and it was it was really great to have that that input. Yeah. Yeah. One of the ways that. We ended up influencing the book, I, I hope in a way that was satisfying, was that it, it's clearly important for the poems to be in the order in which they are. And so that meant that those images had to follow in the book. And so it wasn't mm -hmm. Susan's original uh, order. order. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 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 So does that mean that you're saying that, that was, I was wondering, you each didn't write a poem and then switch and then, and then start over. And each one is connected to the next. Yeah, yes. It's a conversation. Uh, yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. all the way through. Now I wrote a poem, she sent it to me. Right. I wrote a poem, I sent it to right. her. So it was yeah. happening. That, it was a back and forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, there, and that repeating line ties the right. two of them together. And then ties them all together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.